Major funding for the Eyes of Nye was provided by the National Science Foundation, America's investment in the future, and by the estate of Sperry H. Goodman. In sports, world records are being broken all the time. Athletic performances keep getting better and better. Now, when I think of competition, I think of a plain old foot race. I'll race you from here across that field. Hey, uh, you're Maurice Green, right? Yes. Good morning. You want to race? Yeah, we can race. We'll see what you got. All right, Maurice. Set, go! There's an old saying. Doesn't matter if you win or lose, it's how you play the game. What, are you kidding? Look at all these trophies. We're obsessed with winning. That's why coaches, trainers, and athletes use the principles of science to develop winning formulas. When you root for your favorite player or the home team, are you really rooting for the science of sports? Well, let's have a look. Your baseball fans. Oh yeah. Now are you also physics fans? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are you a physics fan? No. You're not a physics fan. Not too much. When you see a guy uh, propelling himself with uh, intermittent contact with that uh, granular surface, you're talking about running. Yeah. When you see this uh, inelastic collision between the wooden cylinder and that leather spheroid. Right. It starts out as a parabola, but then it's got this. Uh, First order term with the aerodynamic drag constantly slowing the ball down. And he's going to uh, come across that uh, rectangular prism out there that's covered with canvas. The bag. The ball might have some spin on it, some Magnus effect, providing a slight amount of lift. The denominator and the density of the air and the numerator. What do you feel? You ever hit it just right on the sweet spot, right above the center percussion there? Yeah. The ball just seems to jump off the bat, right? Sure. Maybe at 35 degrees, arcing over the infield. Right, and then aerodynamic drag takes over and starts to slow down. Maybe it hits the ground, and this top spin transfers some more of that angular momentum into linear momentum. What do you feel? Great. <laughs> so how much do athletes think about physics? All of the techniques of these various uh, uh, sport movements, there's a lot of uh, uh, physics involved. And early on in my career, I would look at, you know, videotapes of me and see if the shot was going at the right angle. Maybe it should go down and so go up a little bit. And it, that was very important. You're sensing timing. And this is the part of the, of the physics that comes into play, is that you have to have certain angles and trajectories and things like that. But prior to that, you have to have a certain timing. So you build up speed and then you settle and then you explode out. So it's, it's a matter of the technique and also the timing of the technique, which are kind of two different things. What's more beautiful than combining sport with artistic performance? Skaters not only manage their speed, they manage their spin their angular momentum. You see, a skater starts a spin with his arms outstretched. As they bring their arms in, their angular momentum gets more and more concentrated and their spin speeds up. It can be the difference between a good performance and a great one. It can take you to a 6.0. Maybe one day, they'll have an Olympic gold medal for physics. A man can dream. Most sports involve motion. That's mass and the transfer of energy. Now, if those terms sound familiar, well, they should. They're right out of a physics book. You see, it's physics principles and mathematical formulae that athletes have been mastering for years. That's why we love to watch.
So, John, doctor, what's the key to hitting a tennis ball? Well, you know, it's surprising because I think most people would assume that if you want to hit a tennis ball, you hit it with your arm. You hold a racket, you hit it with your arm. But actually, you, there's very little power you can generate with your arm. If you really want to hit a tennis ball hard, you actually hit the ball with your legs. So here we go, Bill. This is Claire, and Claire is going to show us how you use your legs to really whack a tennis ball. See, look at that. that she pushes off those legs. Her hips turn, and then that arm just follows through, transmits all that energy into the ball. Daria is going to show us what happens if you try to hit a tennis ball without your legs. I'm going to hold her hips steady, so I'm not going to let her use that leg power in the shot. So go ahead, Daria, give this a try. And little, you can uh, see different sound. it is a very different sound, and that ball is going nowhere. There's nothing there. And so the reality is you hit a tennis ball with your legs. The oldest sport in history is wrestling, going back 20,000 years. All that muscle against muscle, physics against physics. Sumo wrestling is one of Japan's most popular sports even today, using strength and leverage to push your opponent out of the ring. I don't know why more sumo wrestlers aren't playing professional football. Khalif, you're big, you're heavy, you got strong legs. You get your center of gravity lower than theirs and you upend them, creating torsion in the gravity field. Justin, you've got speed, you've got hand-eye coordination. You get down there and you get your hands moving the same speed as the ball and you catch it. You got the high friction gloves? All right, ready, break. 71, 36, cut, cut. Take a look at these athletes. One is a lean, powerful swimmer. The other is a strong, muscular football player. In swimming, it takes more than muscle to compete. It's physics. A swimmer has to balance four forces. Body weight, propulsion, buoyancy, and drag. A swimmer's lungs hold air to keep him afloat, and his muscles propel him forward. But he's always working against drag, which is anything that slows him down. His weight, the roughness of his skin, the impact of waves in the pool. Swimmers train their bodies to be smooth and straight because in competition, drag can be a real drag. We spend more time in coaching swimming working on the elimination of drag forces than we do on the propulsion or velocity forces. We do some exercises, and Justin can show you here, where we try to pull the lower back in a position, stabilize and create a flat lower back, and then a high neck position, creating the longest, flattest line through the length of the body, creating a nice long axis of rotation. Go ahead and do a hip pop. Right in a nice flat back position, and then do a chicken neck. Bring your neck in, creating a nice long line, mm -hmm. and that's what's most important to us in, in creating the right body position. The margin of victory in sports often depends on using the tools of the game to best advantage. What does it take to hit a home run? Well, it's a combination of three things. The speed of the ball, the speed of the bat, and the angle at which the ball is hit. So in the major leagues, they can throw 90 miles an hour. A major league player can swing the head of the bat at about 70 miles an hour. Now, if he can make contact at the right angle of, say, about 35 degrees, he can hit the ball out of the park for a home run. <laughs> but a slower ball, hit with a bat going about the same speed, won't go as far, but the really strong players, like, say, Mark McGuire in his day, he could hit a home run no matter how fast the ball was going. Me, it's a little different story. The whole problem for all of us, though, is the whole thing is over in just a thousandth of a second. Huh, not bad. These are not real baseball physics formulas. For real baseball physics formulas, please go to our website. People shouldn't compete. They should work together. 
I even tried playing football once with a football made out of hemp and it still wasn't cool. And besides, it got really soggy. Yeah. And sports is violent and all about losing. And the universe is not about losing. It's about love. That's why I made the sign. Down with sports. <laughs> hey, I, I made one too. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's nice. Huh. Mine's like totally bigger than yours. <laughs> so? It doesn't matter whose sign is bigger. It's the message. Yeah, yeah, that's that's cool, I guess. Yeah. Except my bigger sign will get the message out to more people. <sighs> Just mad because I kicked your in Frisbee golf. What? No way. I beat you by like 400 points. I thought we weren't keeping score. Yeah, I said I wasn't, but I was inside my head. Whatever. See, that, that's just what human beings do. It's our nature, man. Yeah, it's gonna be your nature to sleep outside the bus tonight, too. Jerk. Oh, that's right. Since the time of Hercules, athletes have been pushing their bodies to be faster, stronger, leaner, and meaner. Now, why do they do it? To win! To get that physical edge in competition. The edge that will push them over the top. Make them a champion, number one. Earn them a world record and perhaps even a place in history. All right, Maurice. Set. The 100 meter sprint. In 1896, the world record was 12 seconds. By 1900, it was 11 seconds. 1964 was only 10 seconds. That's a 20% improvement in less than 100 years. <laughs> You're gonna go faster and faster, right? Guys like you. What do you think the lower limit is? I mean, is it gonna be 9.0 in a century? What do you think? Who, who knows? But I mean, like I've always said, as time progress, man will progress and your man will get faster. Now, Olympic records are broken all the time. I mean, we're running 100 meters now in less than 10 seconds. How fast are people gonna be able to run? The cheetah goes uh, 100 meters in a little less than five seconds, maybe 4.3 seconds. I don't think we're ever gonna go as fast as a cheetah. I mean, we're made of the same stuff, bones and muscles, but I don't think we're ever gonna beat a cheetah. <sighs> so, Humans, around nine and a half. I mean, not me, but but real sprinters. And cheetah, around four and a half. I don't know if we're at the limit. We can probably start to see it from here, though. Where, where does cheetah go? You know, we we should we should probably get out of here. The boundaries of human performance have not been tapped fully, and I don't think they ever will. There will always be an evolution over the course of centuries. Because you always think you can go further. There's always that, you know, I threw this far in this competition or I did this in the Olympics, but I could do better. If I go back and I train, I can do better. So why do the records keep getting broken? Well, for the shot put, it's two things. It's strength and it's speed. The more speed you can develop inside that seven foot ring and the greater the strength of that athlete, the farther that 16 pound ball is gonna go. So why are people faster and stronger now than they used to be? Lifting weights. Primarily it's lifting weights. And there's a, I think there's a natural evolution of the body being able to move more quickly in space. So in other words, you think a modern kid, shot putting, is, has evolved, is better than you are by two generations. Yeah, because the, the size, just the size of the athletes that are out there uh, are much larger than they were when I was in high school. thinking, sure, physics, evolution, and drive are all good, but Bill, what if there's an injury? Athletes get hurt all the time, every day. What's your science going to do for that? I'm glad you asked, because the cutting edge of conditioning is injury prevention, cleverly called prehabilitation. It means trainers are conditioning the bodies of athletes to resist injury based on what might go wrong in their sport. 
Athletes may have to take the hit, but using the right techniques, maybe they can avoid serious injury. Ah, that's gotta hurt. We're trying to train the rotator cuff uh, into, into thinking on its own a little bit. We're trying to provide a, a visual stimulus to uh, so Ben can react to it very quickly as he'll have to react to it on the football field. We prehabilitate shoulders. What we do with shoulder exercise is to try and get football players and other athletes to not have shoulder injuries. We're training to get these muscles to have that really fast reaction time. So it's not just about pure power. It's about fast reaction time. So anywhere this arm needs to point, we've got that shoulder blade pointing in that direction. So we've always got this in the right position to promote maximum stability. If I'm a linebacker and I've got a hold of you and I have to look at the quarterback, I have to be able to make those muscles react very quickly. So that's what we're trying to do here. Not only make them strong, but make them very reactive and very quick. I think for most athletes, the core, what's called the core, is the weak link. The core is the center of the body. It's essentially where the belly button is going all around. And so if the core is weak in hitting a baseball, hitting a golf ball, throwing a shot put, that will usually end up being uh, the downfall of that athlete. They always think about the upper body first, and then they think about the leg second. Usually they think about the middle, the torso, third. A lot of people have low back problems, just in non-athletes, uh, non and that's because they're, it's not very strong relative to the rest of the body. How do you make your midsection strong? I do things like sit-ups. I mean, those are old-fashioned, but still good. You do another uh, kind of a reverse sit-up, which is called a hyperextension to strengthen the lower back. So by flexing forward, leaning forward, pulling yourself up in this respect, you work the abdominals, which is in the front musculature here, and that by extending your back, by lifting up against gravity, you strengthen the lower back. Muscle condition, equipment, athletic technique, they're all important aspects of the science of sports. But for maximum performance, you have to make them all work together. You have to go beyond physics and into the mind. See, I could have played pro ball. Now, most people would assume that Hope Solo would be such a great goalkeeper because she has great muscular strength. What makes Hope Solo such a great goalie is a great brain that processes information extremely quickly that gives her these lightning fast reflexes, this ability to move so quickly, get to the ball. First, she has to see the ball. She needs to make a decision, which is taking place in the middle of the brain, and then she needs to say, I need to get moving. And remember, this is taking place in all less than a second. Less than a second. It's amazing. Some call it quick reflexes. But what's actually happening with Hope are programmed motor patterns. So what does that mean? Well, let's see what takes place in Hope's brain as she blocks a shot. First, we have sensory input. When the ball is kicked by her opponent, her eyes send information into this part of her brain, the occipital cortex, telling it the direction the ball was kicked and the speed at which it's flying toward her. A moment later, this information is processed here, in the premotor cortex, where motor decisions are made, like where the ball is going and whether it needs to be saved or blocked, whether she should jump or dive. Once she makes a decision, a signal is sent here to her motor cortex to fire the muscles and continuous feedback loops with the cerebellum to coordinate all her muscle actions. And finally, she pounces. The complexity of her coordinated movement is lightning fast. We've got things happening in the cerebral motor cortex, the spinal cord, motor nerves, muscles, sensory nerves, cerebellum, cerebrum, and back all over again, all before you can say Mississippi. Her brain is working so fast, it's like a supercomputer or a super-duper computer. But the funny thing is, she's thinking about it without ever realizing it. Just ask her. Nice stop. Uh, Hope, what goes through your mind when, when you do that? You know, to be honest, I really don't think a whole lot. It just kind of happens. I focus on the ball, and the next thing you know, my body just reacts, and hopefully I make the save. The computing functions of the mind never stop when a game is in play. When a deep fly ball is hit in baseball, the fielder moves to make the catch. But he rarely moves in a straight line. Usually, it's a gentle arc. 
Now, why is that? It's the same as when you throw a Frisbee to your dog. The dog's constantly making adjustments, taking a curved path because her position relative to the disc is always changing. Calculations are going on all the time. It's fascinating. Isn't it, Tess? She's fascinating. In some sports, you have forever to think before you make a move. In other sports, they don't even want you to talk while they're thinking. A golfer has to make all the same calculations as any other athlete before she makes a shot. Whether you're Hope Solo or Tiger Woods, when you're on top of your game, you're in the zone. Good evening, and welcome to In the Zone, the show that examines speed, dexterity, and mental quickness, the ingredients that add up to that intangible quality found in all great athletes and performers. Today, we match Hope Solo, the goalie for the United States women's soccer team, with video store clerk Craig Baker. Let's see who's in the zone. The ball is getting close to the goal. Hope gets in position. Oh, let's check with Craig. What a lame choice. Orson Welles. Reflexes, training, and lightning fast decision making. The hallmarks of a great athlete. You want to try this? This is excellent. Join us next week on In the Zone. When you're shot putting, just for example, what are you thinking about? As little as possible. Now, everybody says that, as little as possible. Yeah. Is that the zone? That, that is really the zone. You know, at that point in time, you practice the movement you know, 5.7 million times. So you got to know it by then, you would, one would think. So at that point, it's a matter of just getting in the ring and just going blank and just letting it happen. How do you get in the zone? It took years of me training and learning how to actually quiet my mind. So at a young age, everybody would say, you got to get psyched up. But when you get to the Olympic level, not too many people are psyched up, the ones that do well. They're the ones that are kind of quiet. Now, what about the role of the crowd? The crowd is immense. You take on their energy. There's, there's energy that's directed towards you. you know, they're kind of supporting you. And in that support, it just kind of gives you this little extra sense of... I can do it. We've talked a lot about the physics, the science of sports, but there's still a mystery. Why do we play sports? I mean, look at us. We spend billions of dollars every year on stadia, on uniforms, on player salaries, on merchandise. Why is that? I mean, are modern sporting events just the same kind of thing, a modern recreation of when our tribe met the other tribe from down the trail at that clearing in the woods? We got together to see who was better at throwing stones, or is it more than that? I think we're obsessed with sports because we don't know what's going to happen. It's the ultimate drama. What's more exciting than the last hole? The players are tied neck and neck, and one of them just hit a birdie, and the other one's just teeing off. What's more exciting than the bottom of the ninth? Two outs. You're at the plate. Two strikes and runners in scoring position, and one hit, and you win the game. What's more exciting than to be down by two points, and your team's got the ball at the three-point line, and there's two seconds on the clock, and he turns and he shoots? Nothing's more exciting. You see, the thing about sports is we don't know how it's going to end till it ends. It's not over until it's over. That's the passion, beauty, and joy of athletic competition. Well, if you excuse me, uh, there's a game on. I'll see you next time on The Eyes of Nine. Hit it where they ain't. And you shouldn't be yelling this loud at a golf course. We've covered a lot of ground, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Check out eyesofnigh.org for more cool science.